Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today on calculating pasture and grazing to build soil and profitability. My name is Kate Tarrant and I work for the Lower Blackwood Landcare Group and for those of you that don't know us, we are a not-for-profit independent landcare organisation with an interest in sustainable agriculture and the broader environment and river health in the Lower Blackwood catchment. And you can find out more about us and the work we do on our website at lowerblackwood.com.au. Um, before we kick off, I'd like to acknowledge the, the traditional owners of the land on which we all live and work. I acknowledge the Wadandi and Pibbulmun people of the Bibbulmun Nation and pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Um, I apologise to those of you that already know the drill, but for first timers, just a few words about how the webinar will run today. Uh, you may have noticed by now that you can hear us but not speak. Um, that's deliberate so that we can keep things moving along at a good pace, but you can definitely still ask questions. So please don't be shy, just type your question at any time into the chat box and uh, I'll make sure it gets asked at the end of the presentation. Um, also, if you do run, in, run into any technical difficulties, you can use the status button, which you see on the right hand um, bottom of your screen uh, to let me know and I will see if I can fix it from our end. But don't worry though, if you do um, have to leave early or drop out for any reason, we will be recording the session, or we, we are recording the session and I'll email that out to you next week. Okay, enough of all that housekeeping. Um, I'm delighted to have presenting to us today, holistic management educator, Dr. Judy Earle. In addition to a PhD in pasture ecology, Judy has extensive experience in how grasslands and pastures respond to grazing and fertility management. Judy has a special interest in working with land managers to enhance the condition and productivity of the land through improved understanding of ecosystem function and more effective utilization of available resources. Today, Judy will be talking to us about the critical skill of pasture assessment, its place in the business of grazing and in building soil health, and how it can influence pasture and animal production task targets. So without further ado, welcome Judy, and I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, Kate, and it's really good to be back with you all. Um, we'll get the show on the road. Um, see if I can work this technology. I just thought, um, it was worth just starting with a bit of a reminder of um, the basics of grazing management, some basic principles. Um, the first of which, even though you're in the grazing business and um, running grazing enterprises, the soil and the pastures really are the basis of your business. It all starts with the soil. Uh, and then the next step is uh, the capture of sunlight energy through that process of photosynthesis, which which really drives pasture growth. So the more photosynthetic capacity um, and photosynthesis that's going on, uh, the greater your level of productivity from your grasslands and the health of your grasslands will be. And then of course, uh, understanding um, grass growth and how grass responds to, or grasses respond to defoliation. It's really important to have a, a good understanding of those processes um, in order to enable you to control grass growth effectively. Um, and the fact that grazing management is a really important factor that can assist in controlling part plant growth rate. So I think that there's generally, um, most people underestimate the influence of grazing management on pasture growth um, as a function of um, the plant's response to defoliation. So it's really important to acknowledge the role of grazing management in influencing plant and pasture growth rate generally. And then finally, uh, the importance of monitoring and planning, which is really the focus of today's activity. Um, it really allows you to make um, much more informed decisions um, and enable you to effectively plan the grazing, which is really a, a critical part of uh, boosting productivity. So that's really going to be the focus of the bulk of the presentation today. Um, but I, I just thought it was worth recapping a few of the basic principles. So uh, in terms of grass growth, um, the, um, the, the basis of, basics of, of how grasses grow really um, is the same for a pretty much all grasses. They, there's a, a slight variation depending on the growth cycle of individual species, 
but pretty much all pastures grow. I'm just going to see if I can get my cursor up, the pointer. Seems like it's on. Can you see that pointer on the screen there? Um, I will continue based on uh, the assumption that you can see that pointer. But all, all grasses effectively start their growth relatively slowly. Obviously, annuals will, will have a, a shorter period of slow growth before uh, the, the leaf area increases and they go into this phase of, of rapid growth. Um, and that will go through until later in spring and uh, in your environment at least. Um, and then through the summer, it will slow and uh, the quality and rate of growth will decline. So, of course, as the rate of growth increases, the actual quality of the pasture declines. So um, the digestibility declines, the um, metabolizable energy of that pasture declines as the structural material in the, in the plant increases. So you see here the optimal nutritional value of those grasses occurs around about the end of phase one. Um, but the optimal time for grazing for plant persistence and pasture production occurs much later at the top of the growth curve. So with grazing for regenerative outcomes, we want to sort of be grazing at this level of the, uh, of the curve rather than down here. So the, the nutritional value of the plants is much higher at this point, but the, the point at which grazing for resilience and persistence of pastures is, is much higher on the curve. So when we get to um, influencing plant growth with management, there are really, I mean, grazing management is an enormously complex or the, the, the processes that, that go on in grasslands and the interaction between soils, plants and animals is enormously complex. But there are four simple things that really are within, well within your control. So the first of those is the recovery period. Um, and we've got a variation there in terms of the, uh, the growing season. So the recovery period during the growing season will be much less, or the required recovery period will be much less than the recovery period when plants are either slow, slowly growing or not growing at all. And the graze period should be a function of the recovery that's needed but it will also be dependent on how many subdivisions you have in your, in your pasture. So, and then the next is the residual herbage mass, which is really critical. It's really related to um, um, the concept of utilization um, and leaving sufficient herbage mass at the end of any um, graze period will really influence the rate of recovery of those plants. So the, the basic principle is the more that you grow, the more that you leave behind, the faster it will grow and um, the more pasture you will grow at the end of the day. And then the final factor, of course, is, uh, is the stock numbers or your, your stocking rate effectively. So those are the, the four key things that are within your control uh, in the management of grazing. Um, and in terms of monitoring, those are the, the key things that we want to keep an eye on. So when we get to measurement of pasture, um, measuring pasture essentially, um, because pasture production is the basis of the grazing business, um, it's really essential that we plan the stocking rate and plan how much residual we want to leave behind at the end of any graze event. And so that's going to allow us to set pasture production targets and animal production targets, which will influence um, our planning and controlling of the grazing. So the, the key thing that we want to look at in, um, in measurement of pasture is that circled area there. We want to measure the pasture so that we can plan to match the stocking rate to the sustainable carrying capacity of the property or the, uh, the grazable area. And we want to actively plan to leave sufficient residual 
behind at the end of any individual Grey's event. So in terms of um, pasture assessment, you know, why, why are we going to do it? You know, what, why would we need to be assessing pasture? Essentially, as um, in terms of a, a grazing business, your pasture growth is going to determine your sustainable stocking rate. So by actually planning the grazing, we can enhance pasture growth, which really influences our, the available pasture for the stock, which is essentially utilization. And in doing so, um, by growing more pasture of a higher quality, improve the profit, profitability of the enterprise, but also regenerate the land. So it allows you, by assessing the pasture, it allows you to apply a more adaptive approach to management. And the other thing, I guess, to, to make a point of there is a, a lot of people see um, conservation and land regeneration as being mutually exclusive to, um, to higher stocking rates. Whereas I guess my main mantra is that, you know, grazing livestock are probably the most important tool that you've got available to actually enhance pasture growth and improve the uh, condition of your landscape. So when we're actually actively monitoring the pasture, we can physically influence and optimize pasture growth rate and also production. And it really needs to be a daily management activity that you incorporate in, in your everyday practices. Um, it's just like anything else. Um, the more practice, the more you do it, the more skilled you become, and the more accurate you become in your assessment. And it basically just becomes a habit and obviously a good habit to, uh, to develop. So in terms of when, to um, be actively monitoring. Obviously, the more you do it, the, the more skilled you, you get and the more it becomes second nature. But I'd suggest as a minimum, when you're looking at um, a thorough assessment of your pastures, the, um, the three critical times in, an, in a normal season are indicated here on this chart. So we've got this point here. This is probably the most important um, in your environment towards the end of November when pastures are, um, are slowing in terms of their growth. Basically what you've got on the ground at that time of the year is what you've got until the break uh, in the autumn. So it's really critical to um, assess your pastures there so that you can apply the appropriate stocking rate to carry through that summer. So essentially what you've got at that point um, will dictate how many stock you can sustainably carry through the summer period to minimize any substitution feeding that might be needed, but also to plan to leave a suitable residual at the end of the summer months. Basically that will encourage um, optimal autumn growth um, as well as maintain stock and hopefully minimize the need for substitution feeding. So the next point is probably in, in mid-summer, maybe through, uh, through January to check on how you're tracking with your plan, making sure the plan is actually going to plan and making any adjustments that might be needed. And then um, potentially at the end of the summer, coming towards the, uh, the autumn break, um, just check in and see how the autumn break is looking. So they're probably the, the key times to do a, a thorough monitor of uh, across the property in terms of your pastures. Um, but as I said, um, if you can be out there monitoring your pasture growth on a monthly basis, then you're going to rapidly improve your skills in pasture assessment and be much more flexible uh, in your management. So in terms of, um, of the how-to, We'll, we'll move on to that, um, that section. Um, and we've basically created some a fairly simple tool, I believe, um, over time. I think I just checked the date that this was first published. I think it was about 2005. But uh, Lewis Kahn and myself, I, I was working with Lewis at the time, and we were working with, um, with graziers 
primarily on the Northern Tablelands and the North Coast here in New South Wales, but we've developed similar um, uh, manuals for, for graziers in South Australia and uh, in various parts of Queensland. It's essentially a, a 12 point checklist to um, relatively quickly and effectively assess the various elements of your pasture and the condition of your pasture. In terms of the feed budgeting, um, probably the, the main the main element is um, measurement of herbage mass. But um, the um, the booklet is available for download if you go to this website here. Um, you can download the uh, the booklet for free from that website, um, and probably, obviously, understanding the the differences in the in the seasonality, you might need to adjust some of the ideal figures um, on a seasonal basis to make it much more relevant for your area. But uh, the principles of pasture monitoring are identical, and the the key is to make this checklist um, work for you and and suit your environment. So the, the first point to make, I think, is, um, is to talk about this pasture height weight relationship. So, so the basis of our me method of measuring herbage mass is this pasture height weight relationship. So, um, and this will be specific to, um, to different pasture types. So um, many of you might be familiar with the uh, MLA ruler which is, I think, um, quite appropriate in um, your environment. But this particular approach um, incorporates a, a similar, it's along the same lines, but it's a little bit more flexible in terms of, um, of its applicability to different pasture types. So um, I can't tell you how many times or how many thousands of quadrats would have been cut and dried and weighed um, after measuring the height of the material in each of the quadrats, but that's been the process. So we've we've put these uh, these uh, quarter of a meter square quadrats uh, on a particular pasture and looked at a range of heights. So the photograph on the left, the pasture in that particular quadrat is two point six centimeters. The middle one, seven point three, and on the right here is fifteen centimeters. So we cut and dried and weighed material from that pasture and came up with this relationship. Um, so the photograph on the left, 2.6, the weight of the material from that quadrat was 58 grams. Because it's a quarter of a meter squared, we multiplied that by 40 and come up with 2,320 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. So the same process was applied to each of those quadrats. The tallest one that was on the right-hand side in the previous slide was 15 centimetres. Material weighed 179 grams multiplied by 40 is equivalent to 7,160 kilos of dry matter per hectare. So when we plot those figures on this relationship, the dry weight against the pasture height, we come up with this line of best fit to give us a height weight relationship. And this particular pasture was quite dense equivalent to 400 kilograms of dry matter per centimetre per hectare. And so that's the basis of, um, of our approach to measuring herbage mass. It was a little bit long-winded, but I think if you understand the theory behind it, then you're probably a little bit better equipped to understand the whole process as, as we go through. So in terms of selecting a site, um, we want to select an area in the paddock that is representative of the paddock. So in my experience, the vast majority of the pastures that uh, I saw when I was there a few months ago, they're relatively uniform in terms of the uh, the composition and the, and the height of the pasture. And in that instance, probably one measurement from that sort of paddock is enough. If you've got larger paddocks that have got a bit more variability in terms of pasture composition or um, there's a bit of slope or um, maybe wetter areas, you might need to take two or three measurements from an individual paddock. But I'd say on the whole, most for most people, one measurement um, of a pasture will be enough as long as that 
area is representative of the whole paddock. So what we want to do is either select a, a representative 10 by 10 meters square or walk in a transect and take at least 10 measurements of pasture height. So we want to measure to the top of the bulk of the leaf, not to the, the, the height the, of the uh, leaf extended. We want to be measuring the, the bulk of pasture biomass. And um, as many of you who would have been to the workshop or I visited, you would know that I'm mathematically challenged. So um, I recommend taking at least at least 10 measurements. Um, and the maths is a lot easier to do. And then we want to record the results. So if you have a chance to look at the checklist, the recording sheet looks um, something like this. So we've got um, on each recording page, um, a spot to record the paddock name, the grazable area and the date, which is most important. And then you'll see, um, aside from each element, there is, um, there's four squares there and one that's a, a bit heavier. So if you're measuring um, at one particular site, just, just enter the data in the, in the heavy, heavier squared area. But if you're taking two or three measurements across the paddock, then take the average, and if you want to be really clever, take the weighted average and enter that in that uh, heavier weighted square. So you'll see that there's there's 12 elements here that are listed. Um, there's Each of them is labelled with a letter here. So we want to be looking at nine measures in the paddock, and I'll go through each of these elements really quickly now. And then there is um, three measures that I basically referred to as uh, as KPIs, um, pasture growth rate, water use efficiency and pasture utilisation, which will require a calculator and generally a cup of tea or a beer or a glass of wine at the end of the day. Um, and then um, again, referring to the checklist, uh, you've got the opportunity to identify which factors are, um, are really low uh, in your pastures and, and need focusing on correcting and which factors are ideal. And for example, most of the pastures that I saw were really good in terms of, of ground cover um, and mostly quite good in terms of legume content. Um, most were quite low in perennial grass components. So for example, uh, down here, we would label uh, H as being low in that instance and the ideal factors would be uh, D, F, um, and any of the others that uh, that were <laughs> uh, high on the score. So that's the recording sheet. And you'll notice that there is um, uh, opportunity to record four events, four monitoring events there. Um, so at least seasonally, um, but I, I'll make the point that the more you measure pasture growth rate, if you can do it regularly on a monthly basis, that would be ideal. But uh, at least on a seasonal basis, we'll give you a pretty good feeling for how your pasture is, is performing. So we'll get into the actual um, monitoring side of things, um, how to estimate herbage mass. So we want to measure the height in centimetres. So as I said, we want to measure the bulk of the, the height of the leaf or the, the height of the bulk of the pasture, I should say. Um, and in this instance, we've got a lot, you can see a lot of um, stems and um, inflorescences. We want to ignore all of that because most of what is going to contribute to the animal's diet will be the, uh, the bulk of the leaf at the base. So that's what we're most interested in from an animal production perspective and it also in terms of maintaining ground cover and all of those soil processes or effective function of those soil processes. So. We measure the pasture height. In the previous example, uh, it was um, 10 centimetres. And then we apply this um, density factor. And it's sort of related to ground cover, but um, but not, not purely. Um, but if you can see any ground through a sparse pasture, then the density that you would apply would be 200 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per centimetre. Most of the pastures, again, that I looked at um, while I was there in June would 
be at least of average density, about 300 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. There was rarely any ground visible through an average pasture. And this is the figure that I've been encouraging people to um, be looking at and using in the first instance in the absence of any previous records. So if you start at that point, you won't go too far wrong. And as I mentioned, the example that I gave earlier was of a really high density pasture, which was equivalent to 400 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per centimetre. So we combine the two and get a response for, or get a measurement of herbage mass. So our pasture height was 10 centimetres and we are applying a figure for an average density, which is 300 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. So 10 centimetres times 300 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per centimetre is equivalent to 3,000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare on it on, uh, in that particular pasture. And it's probably worth noting that we're always measuring on a dry matter basis. Um, the water in the pastures obviously influ influences the, uh, the quality, but in terms of, uh, of animal intake, it's got um, minimal Im input and uh, intake nutrition wise. So um, it's we're always doing these measures on a dry matter basis. So another thing to consider is in very tall pastures, once you get very tall pastures, you get a lot of airspace between the leaf. So, so we applied this, um, this ready reckoner, if you like. So if we've got no ground visible um, in an average pasture, such as this one here, which is about 10 centimetres again, 10 centimetres times an average density pasture is equivalent to about 3,000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. And uh, over here we've got Karen in um, a fairly tall patch of Kaikuyu, which was around about 25 centimetres of height. And you'll see here, as the pasture gets taller, we can reduce, or it's worthwhile reducing the estimation of density in that instance. So for a Kaikuyu pasture that's 25 centimetres high, with ground not visible readily, we'd apply a density measure of 250 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. So 25 centimetres multiplied by 250 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per centimetre gives us a pasture biomass, herbage mass of around about 5,000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. So um, that's probably the most important in terms of feed budgeting and, um, and planning grazing, measuring and having confidence in your measurement of herbage mass is probably the main thing. But I'll just flick through a few of the additional considerations that are listed in that 12 point checklist. Um, and they're listed here and I'll just cover them very briefly uh, individually. So the first one is uh, the percentage edible. And as I said, I think um, most of the uh, the pastures that I looked at while I was there were in um, in pretty good condition and, and highly nutritious in terms of the um, material available to stock. But there were some instances where there was uh, patches of rushes or patches of um, relatively unpalatable plants such as uh, African lovegrass. Um, and so we want to actually discount our measure of herbage mass um, according to the proportion of the, um, the forage that is edible. And that's going to change from season to season. Um, species, as they go through their, their different life cycle, growth cycles, are going to change in their relative palatability to, um, to other species that are in, in the mix. So we can discount... Um, based on the volume of those un unpalatable species, or perhaps an easier way to deal with it is to discount the actual grazable area when you come to uh, doing an estimate. It, it depends on, on how much or how many, how much of the area um, is uh, occupied by these less palatable species. And uh, as I said, um, the other factor that will influence that might be wet areas, uh, rocky areas, areas of the paddock that might um, 
might be dominated by shrubs, um, and a lot of that might be easier to uh, to discount uh, on grazable area, as I said. But uh, it's just important to consider in terms of your estimations of uh, of herbage mass. So um, the next one is uh, is ground cover, which is probably the first step when we we talk about soil health. I mean, certainly not the uh, the be all and end all. But um, in the absence of 100% ground cover, then other things are not going to be functioning optimally. So uh, here is a, um, an example that's uh, actually within the checklist of a, a range of different ground cover measures. Um, and there's also an estimate of pasture density at the base there. So as I said, um, this is all available for, um, for free download and Kate is also going to um, send this presentation out. So um, it's, it'll be easy enough for you to, to follow through and, and use those guidelines. In terms of sustainable um, perennial pastures, the ideal sort of mix that um, I look at promoting is about 10 to 15 cent percent broadleaves. Um, other people might define those as, as weeds. Um, somewhere between 15 and 25% uh, legumes, ideally 10 to 15% annuals um, and 60 to 80% perennial grasses. Um, so that's going to be quite different to the scenario that most of you have um, in pastures in your region at the moment, but um, it might be a bit of a guide in terms of something to aim for if you are particularly trying to improve the perenniality of your pastures. So, and another comment that came up um, um, earlier when um, I was, I had this slide was, if you've actually planted multi-species, which has a higher component of uh, annuals or cereal crops, then you'd be looking for a higher figure here. But this is just a guideline um, in terms of the ideal, or my view of the ideal, um, composition of a of a of a perennial pasture, um, and just quickly, um, the other point to make uh, when you're assessing pastures is that um, lots of people tend to look at clovers with uh, rose coloured glasses, um, um, and this obviously looks like it's dominated by uh, by clover, but when that quadrat was uh, cut and dried and, and weighed and uh, separated the clover from the from the grass the clover in that instance only contributed to um, about 50 percent of the of the dry matter of that quadrat in total so just be aware that um, the clover the dry weight of clover is uh, is relatively much less than the dry weight of of your grasses so the final step in the monitoring is um is calculating these kpis and um, most of the rest of the presentation will be focused on these sorts of calculations. So, um, so pasture growth rate, we're looking at measuring pasture production over time. So we have defined time periods that we look at pasture growth. Um, I mean, there obviously you select the time um, for estimating pasture growth as you, as you go through the process. As I said, me measured as kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day. And then we use that pasture growth information in combination with rainfall um, to determine the amount of pasture grown per millimetre of rain. And to my mind, that's a, a really uh, key indicator of the health and the function of your soils. Um, you could, because you can have a, a relatively low amount of rainfall, but if your water use efficiency is, is relatively high, then you're making maximum benefit or taking maximum benefit from every drop of rain that that falls. So um, that will apply in, in good seasons and, and dry seasons. But the aim is to maximise the efficiency of conversion of rainfall into pasture at every opportunity. And that will only occur if your soils are functioning and your grazing management is um, is under control and uh, and working towards enhancing the condition of your resource base. And then finally, the proportion of um, pasture that's grown that is consumed by stock is referred to as utilization. 
And I think over time, um, more and more, I've become aware that this, this utilisation percentage is a key factor in determining your potential pasture production. So it influences pasture, pasture growth at the time, but it's its effect is long lasting. So it's really important to keep an eye on and utilize your pastures appropriately. So we'll just work through some examples of um, calculation of these, um, these measures very quickly. Um, so in terms of calculating pasture growth rate, we do a measurement on um, the first first day that we're we're monitoring, um, and in this example, on the first of March, we went out and measured a thousand kilograms of dry matter per hectare, which is equivalent to a, a little over three centimeters of pasture height. And then we went back on the thirty first of May, ninety two days later, and we measured two thousand kilograms of dry matter per hectare, which is equivalent to around about seven centimeters of height. And during that time, stock consumed 1,300 kilograms of dry matter per hectare, which is equivalent to a stocking rate of about 14 DSC per hectare. So that, that could have occurred over 92 days, or it could have occurred over one day or a week or two weeks. It, um, that doesn't, the, the length of time that stock are in there won't influence the, um, the, the calculation, it will certainly influence your land health in the long term. But in terms of this calculation, the actual length of grazing time um, doesn't come into it. So the calculation is um, we subtract the start herbage mass from the end herbage mass. We add the material that livestock have removed from that pasture, divided by 92 days and we come up with a pasture growth for that period from the 1st of March to the 31st of May of 25 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day. And so in that time, and these slides are basically taken from the spreadsheet, um, the pasture checklist calculator, which is associated um, with the checklist and I just see that there's a question there in terms of determining the 1300 figure. So as I said, that was um, related to a stocking rate of 14 DSE per hectare. So during that period, the stock removed on average 14 kilograms of dry matter per hectare over 92 days. So that may have been taken at 14 kilograms every day for 92 days, or it may have been taken 1300 kilograms in a single day. So as I said, the, the actual grazing time is not so relevant, but the stocking rate for the period was 14 DSC. So I'll, I'll get back to water use efficiency. So we've, during that same period, March to May, We've received 225 millimetres of rainfall over the 92 days. Pasture growth rate was recorded at 25 kilos. So to calculate water use efficiency, it's the pasture growth rate, 25 times the length of the period, 92 days, divided by the amount of rainfall received in that period. And our water use efficiency in this instance is 10.2 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per millimeter, which uh, from my experience is would be equivalent to a fairly good uh, level of water use efficiency. Generally, it will range from around about six to 16, and that's gonna be dependent on the season. So obviously you'll, you'll generate far more pasture growth from a rainfall event in uh, spring or autumn than you will during the, uh, the middle of winter. So um, ideally, I think we want to be looking at seasonal measures for water use efficiency. As I said, if you can manage to do monthly measures of pasture growth rate, then that would be ideal. And the final one of our KPIs is um, pasture utilisation. Um, and we've got our stocking rate for the period here. And 
the pasture growth rate again. So to calculate pasture utilization for this three month period, it's our stocking rate divided by pasture growth rate. So the proportion of what's grown that is consumed by livestock multiplied by 100 to give 56.5%, which is pretty close to ideal for that period. So I've redone the um, what I consider to be an ideal um, level of utilization for your environment. Um, and they're here. I won't go into detail, but you'll notice that uh, during summer, because there is so little growth, basically the utilization is in excess of 100 because animals will be grazing pastures that have grown more prior to the summer. Uh, and as I said, the um, um, ideal period to be measuring water use efficiency is probably seasonal. The seasonal utilization rate is important, but the key figure for utilization rate is how much you use annually. So the annual utilization rate and again, I won't spend too much time on, on this chart, but um, I've already mentioned it. I think the mantra is grow more, use more and leave more. So it's what you leave behind that is so important to your potential pasture growth rate. So you'll see the more you grow, if you're growing 10,000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per year, then 70% is probably a sustainable level of utilization. But if you're only growing 6,000 kilos in a year, then you want to bring that back to not more than probably 58%. And, and as production declines, your sustainable level of utilisation declines. And the sustainable level of utilisation is uh, in the figures at the bottom of the bars there. So just again, as a guide, and in terms of controlling utilisation, really the main or the most effective way to control utilization of pastures by grazing, grazing livestock is to um, apply stock density. So um, the more subdivision you can have and the more you can control the grazing, the more you can control the amount of residual herbage mass that you leave behind and influence pasture growth rate and actually give you gives you much more flexibility in the grazing as well. So managing utilization really comes down to controlling stock density and controlling the movement of livestock across the landscape. So that was really a, a, a very quick review of the methods. Um, is there any really quick questions that we can, excuse me, quick questions to deal with on that before we move on to the feed budgeting examples? Okay, we'll hold questions to the end. So in terms of the, the feed budgeting, um, again, those three critical periods uh, that I mentioned at the start, most important to conduct a feed budget towards the end of the growing season um, before plants um, basically stop actively growing because what you've got at that point in time is what you've got for livestock until your autumn break. So the feed budget will depend or will determine the appropriate number of stock that you can carry so, so that you're matching stocking rate to, to carrying capacity of your land through that period, that critical period, so that you can plan to have an appropriate residual at the end of that non-growing period or for whatever period you're doing the feed budget for and adequately plan utilization. And that allows you to actually set your pasture production targets, your animal production targets, and, and then plan and control the grazing. So we use the feed budget as the basis of um, our determining the number of stock to uh, set the amount of residual that we want to have at the end of the period, plan the utilization of that standing material. And then the final step is to plan and control the grazing so that we can utilize our, our pasture most effectively. So the first step in that process is the, is the feed budget. So as an example here, um, and again, um, 
not again, sorry. <laughs> this example um, is, is of pasture growth that was accessed from pastures from space. So it, it may be a bit ambitious. Um, and the animal requirements here have incorporated uh, lambing ewes or, or cows calving um, around May, June. And so you get, as soon as that uh, lamb or calf drops, the requirements of, uh, of livestock um, increase by about 50% um, virtually overnight. So, so you get a big jump in the requirements of animals and we want to budget our feed so that the amount of feed grown is going to meet the requirements of the animals, but also build up a reserve of feed so that we can use this, this uh, excess feed grown through the, through the spring to fill this gap through the summer when the pastures are not growing so actively. And so we really want to be able to, um, to build up this uh, excess here and ration that out over the non-growth period. So in this particular example, the total annual production is equivalent to about 11,000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare over the 12 month period, over the whole of that cycle. And the requirements of animals in this particular instance is equivalent to about 21 DSC per hectare, which is probably a, a little bit um, higher than um, most people are running at the moment. But if you are any chance to achieve those levels of, uh, of stocking rate, you really need to be planning the grazing and planning to leave an adequate residual at the end of the summer. And in terms of the residual herbage mass, that's going to be a moving target as well. So I've got two lines here. Um, the blue line represents what I would recommend in terms of um, aiming to leave an ideal residual at the end of the graze event, each graze event. So um, what we're talking about is the amount of feed that's left in the paddock at the end of a graze event. So I would recommend leaving 2000 kilograms as a minimum, and that way you've always got a drought reserve up your sleeve. Um, in some instances, um, there may be reason to get down to 1500, but once you get below 1500 kilograms of residual herbage mass, then you're compromising the health of your landscape. So um, leaving 1500 kilograms of herbage mass is really critical, but if you get down that low in the summertime, then it's a steep curve to get back up um, to achieve the, the residual required to get you through the following summer. So you really need to be planning um, the residual that you want at the end of summer, starting today, basically. So your planning needs to be about six months in, a, in, a, in advance to uh, ensure that you can achieve those residual targets at the, uh, at the end of the, uh, the growing season. So the things that we need for a feed budget, we need to know the grazable area of the paddock. We need an estimate of the herbage mass. So whether that's um, the herbage mass that's present in a paddock, or ideally if we're doing um, a, um, a pre-summer feed budget, you would want um, an estimate of herbage mass across the whole property, at least an average. We need to know what our stock requirements are, and we need to have some estimate of pasture growth rate. So if you haven't been measuring pasture growth rates historically, then um, it's it will be a bit of guesswork on your part, but uh, all the more reason to be out there measuring pasture growth rates uh, on a regular basis right now so that you can actually develop benchmarks for pasture growth on your own property for various paddocks. Excuse me. So then we want to set the min minimum herbage mass, those residual targets that we want to have at the end of um, end of this end of the planning period, or as it may be the end of the summer. So these sorts of figures um, need some investigation or um, um, some evidence to back up. But there are some DSC tables again; these are available uh, in the checklist. Um, and I'll emphasize again, um, my preference for estimating re animal requirements is to use DSCs. Uh, 
particularly for the, those of us that are mathematically challenged. Um, and even if your DSEs are in cattle, um, the basic and easy conversion is that one DSE eats one kilogram of pasture each day. So these examples are for DSE ratings for various uh, cattle for growth rates, whether they're steers or heifers, um, different weights of animals maintaining weight will have um, requirements to maintain their weight. And you'll notice here, uh, as soon as those animals start to grow, and this is where the quality of the pastures, so um, all of the, the measurements that we're taking really don't take account of quality of pasture. But obviously, if you've got a high quality pasture, then your 200 kilo steer or your 250 kilo steer is going to be growing at a much greater rate than if it's on um, basically dried up annuals over, over the summertime. So, and you'll notice that there's a huge energy requirement in, uh, in growth. So a 250 kilo steer growing at a kilo a day will consume nine and a half kilograms of pasture per day, of dry matter per day, compared to four and a half kilos um, if it's on a, a poor quality pasture and, and not growing. So there's a, a huge demand for growth. And similarly, uh, for lactation, um, a 500 kilo cow here that's dry is around about, requires nine and a half kilograms of dry matter per day to maintain weight and condition. But as soon as that calf hits the ground, her requirements go up to 16 kilograms of dry matter per day. And we always talk about um, uh, cow and calf or ewes and lambs as a single unit while they're together. So these, um, these ratings are available and estimates are available for sheep as well, but I just include those to, um, to give you an example. So an example of how nutritional demand changes over time. So for the feed budget, um, it really is a, is a key process to aid decision making about whether you sell, keep or feed livestock. So it allows you to estimate how much feed is available, how much pasture you want to remain and what the likely pasture growth rate is. And so essentially it will determine how many animals you can sustainably run for how long. And so we'll run through um, a bit of an exercise very quickly. And again, you'll have all of these notes so that you can go back and review in your own time, but hopefully going through stepwise um, will give you a, an idea of the, of the process. So we've got a, an example here, a 100, hect 100 hectare property divided into 10 paddocks of varying size and quality of which 25 hectares is considered not productive. So our total grazing area is 75 hectares. So our aim is to have an average residual herbage mass of 1500 kilograms of dry matter when stock leave any paddock or by the end of summer. So we've gone out and assessed our herbage mass on the 1st of December and across the 10 paddocks, on average, there was 2,600 kilograms of dry matter per hectare present. So that's the average of all 10 paddocks. Um, collectively, the average was 2,600 kilograms of dry matter per hectare, which is our first step uh, in, the, in the process. So we're gonna go through two tasks relatively quickly. So the first task is to calculate a budget to determine the number of 500 kilogram breeding cows that can be run over the summer from the 1st of December to the 30th of April. And then we're gonna go through a very quick demonstration of how to complete a graze plan for the property. So once we've determined how many animals we can run, the next step is to determine what the appropriate graze period in each paddock will be. So this is going to be a very quick run through demonstration of how to use these tools, but hopefully we'll give you enough to, um, 
to review and be able to calculate and use on your own um, in your own situation. So keeping in mind the things that we need for the feed budget, we need an estimate of grazable area. So we're looking at a feed budget for our whole property. We're starting on the 1st of December through to the end of April, which is a total of 150 days. We want to run uh, pregnant cows with a dry with a, um, a mature weight of 500 kilograms. So we're going to give them a DSE rating of 12 DSE per head. So you can adjust this to, uh, depending on um, on your stock and their requirements. So we've gone out and measured 2,600 kilograms of herbage mass of dry matter per hectare of herbage mass across the property. And we don't want to go below 1,500 kilograms of dry matter remaining in any paddock um, over the period. So that's what we want to finish the, the summer with. And to be really conservative, we're going to um, include a pasture growth rate of zero. So again, if you've got some measurement and some benchmark fig figures on your on pasture growth rate on your property over the summer, then you might put one, two or five in there. But the most conservative approach to the feed budget is to put a pasture growth rate of zero for the period, for the non-growing period. So we are going to calculate these th three critical elements right now. The first is to work out how much feed we've got available, how many stock units per hectare we can sustainably run, and then the total number of stock that we can run on the property. So the first step is to measure is to calculate the available feed. And we do that by deducting our end herbage, which is F. So you'll see these letters down here on the left-hand side. So they're referred to in the calculations, both here and in the checklist and on this Excel spreadsheet, if you go down that path. So our start herbage mass E is 2,600 kilos minus our desired end herbage mass, which is F, divided by the length of the period, which is 150 days, plus the pasture growth rate, which we've put in a conservative zero. So we've got 7.3 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day available to allocate to our livestock. So the number of stock units that we can carry is the available feed, that we've just ca calculated, divided by the DSE rating of each of our animals, which is 12 DSE per head nominated here. So we can run 0.6 of a cow per hectare. And so the number of stock that we can carry is equivalent to the number of stock units per hectare multiplied by our grazable area indicated by A up here, which is 75 hectares, we can carry 46 breeding cows for the summer period, for the period from 1 December to the 30th of April, starting with 2,600 kilograms of dry matter per hectare on average, aiming to finish with 1,500 kilos at the end of the day. So now we know how many animals we can run. The next step is to work out how we can best utilize the feed that's available in each paddock. So again, this is going to be a very quick run through the basics of a grazing plan. So we'll start with a spreadsheet that looks like this, and we're going to populate this sheet. So the first thing we want to do is record the total DSE in the mob. So this is column A here. The total DSE in the mob is the number of animals multiplied the, by the DSE rating for each animal. So in this instance, 46 cows times 12 DSE is equivalent, it's actually equivalent to 552, but for those of us that are mathematically challenged, I rounded it down to 550 DSE. So we will record that in column A, and that'll be the same for all of our paddocks, we're gonna run our 46 cows as a single mob from 1 December to the 30th of April. 
And the next step is to record the grazable area of each paddock in column B. And so we'll do that now. And so we've got, as I said, 550 DSE that are running in each paddock. And we've got a record of the grazable area of each paddock in column B here. So the next step, step three, is to calculate the stock density. So the stock density is the total DSE in the mob divided by the grazable area. And the stock density represents the amount of herbage that the mob is going to consume per hectare per day. And so looking at that column now, you'll see based on the um, varying size of the each paddock, the stock density will be varying. So essentially total DSE in the mob divided by the grazable area gives you an indication of how many kilograms of dry matter that mob is going to consume from each hectare for every day that they're grazing that paddock. So in paddock one and two, which are both nine hectares in size, that mob will, re will remove 61 kilograms per hectare per day. In paddock five, for example, which is only five hectares, that mob will consume 110 kilograms of dry matter per hectare from each of those five hectares for every day that that mob is grazing that paddock. So hopefully that's that's clear and we'll move on to the next step which is to record the herbage mass in column C for each paddock. So I mentioned to you that we'd gone out and we'd assessed the paddocks so now we record them here. We record the amount of herbage mass that's present in each paddock in column C. Um, and you can see here paddock one was 3,300 kilograms. So that's going to be equivalent to about 11 centimetres in, in height of the pasture. Um, down here, 2,600 kilograms in paddock five is going to be um, <laughs> around about seven centimetres, I, I think. <laughs> seven, no, it's going to be more than that. It'll be nearly nine centimetres under pressure with my mass. Paddock 10, for example, 2,700 kilograms of dry matter per hectare will be um, nine centimetres, assuming an average pasture density of 300 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. So we record the amount of herbage mass the average herbage mass in each paddock in column C. And then the next step is to record the residual that we want at the end of the period. So that's in column D. And we've stated that our primary goal with this grazing plan is to leave not less than 1,500 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. So that's the figure that is entered in column D for each paddock. So the next step is to calculate the available herbage mass um, for the stock in, uh, in each paddock. So we do this by um, subtracting the residual that we want to leave behind from the available herbage mass on day one that is in column C. And we put a figure for what is available for the livestock from that total herbage mass with a view to leaving this residual in each paddock, the available herbage mass in each paddock will be the difference between those two figures. And so you can see uh, in paddock one, 3,300 kilograms, less the 1,500 kilograms that we want to remain, gives us 1,800 kilograms of dry matter per hectare that is available for our mob over here for the period between 1 December and the 30th of April. You'll also note down here, paddock six and paddock nine, they're actually starting below what we want to leave or equivalent to. So there is actually no grazing days available in those paddocks um, for this period, assuming no growth. That's exactly right. 
Miriam. Um, this method assumes no growth through the period. So our planning period for this example is from 1 December to the 30th of April. So if you've actually got a record of pasture growth for your pastures, then by all means, um, you know, that would be the figure that you would put in uh, and, and add growth to this process. But the most conservative approach for planning through the non-growing period is to put pasture growth at zero. And if you get any growth through that time, then that's a bonus and that will only build capacity in your landscape and improve your pasture growth in the autumn. But this is a super conservative approach to grazing planning through the summer. And it also emphasizes why building up to have a bulk of herbage at the um, at the start of the uh, non-growing period is so important because if you um, plan to have a bulk of herbage at the start of the summer and you plan to have an amount at the end of summer, then you base your stocking rate and your plan on the appropriate number of stock to use the available herbage mass. So you'll see that all of these figures vary down here based on the amount of herbage mass that's available or that's present and your livestock requirements. So the final thing, the final part of the graze plan is to actually calculate the appropriate number of days um, grazing in each paddock. So to calculate the number of days available, which is step seven, column E, we want to divide the available herbage mass by the stock density. So this is how much the stock density over here is how much these animals are taking from each paddock per day. We've got in paddock one, 1800 kilograms of dry matter per hectare available, divided by 550, uh, sorry, divided by the stock density, 61, uh, and we'll get a number for the appropriate number of days grazing, which is 29 for paddock one. So it's the available herbage mass divided by the stock density. Sorry for my guff. Um, and that gives us 29 days grazing available in paddock one. And you'll see that for each of those paddocks, there is a different number of days grazing that is appropriate. There are two paddocks there that are out of contention because there's not sufficient um, herbage mass at the start. So assuming no growth, there will be not sufficient herbage mass at the end either. But you'll also number, notice when you add these figures up, our total days grazing is 157. And so um, I just want to go through and, and make a few points about our, our plan here. So this very simple plan is the basis of um, a graze plan calculator, which is an Excel spreadsheet, which is available uh, again for free download on uh, the AIMS website. You will need to adjust some of the growth rates for your own uh, situation, for your own regional circumstances. But as I said, the principles are the same. But the key thing to notice here is the variation in grazing days. Because of the difference in herbage mass on day one and the relative differences in, in the grazable area of each paddock. So we've got grazing days that vary from 30 um, down to, well, aside from excluding the zeros, down to, down to 10. So a few points just before I wind up in terms of the notes on our plan. We've got 50, 157 days grazing available, which is seven more than our feed budget indicated. We haven't included any pasture growth. So this is worst case scenario. And any growth during the period is gonna be a bonus and it will enhance not only the health of your landscape, um, it will also uh, in, enhance growth into the autumn period. Most importantly, the plan calculates the appropriate grazing days for each paddock 
based on the demand of your livestock, the total DSE in the mob, and this and the area of each paddock and the available herbage mass. So the supply. So you've got the demand in terms of the livestock and the supply in terms of the area of the paddock and the available herbage mass in each paddock. So the the different grazing days for each paddock are due to differences in available herbage mass and paddock area. And the two paddocks that uh, had a res, uh, herbage mass below our residual target were therefore unavailable for grazing. So we leave them out of the equation. They're not available during for, gra for grazing during our planning period. But most importantly, on the 1st of December, we can have confidence that we can run 46 pregnant cows across the property, maintaining a minimum residual herbage mass target, which is going to optimise the condition of our pastures coming into autumn. It will enhance the subsequent growth of the pastures through the autumn and through the winter as well, um, and maintain the health of the landscape. And a couple of extra notes here. If we were to apply a time-based rotation, so um, lots of people are quite comfortable with the idea of a rotational uh, grazing system based on an, a set number of days. So in this scenario, if we had 10 paddocks available for our 150 days, then that would give us an average graze period of 15 days um, across each of in each paddock. So in the example that I've just worked through, paddock number two would be grazed for a few days over the correct period. I think from memory it was 18 days that was appropriate for paddock two. Paddocks one, three, four and ten would be way underutilised uh, over the period and paddocks five to nine would be significantly overutilised and certainly any perennial plants that were present would be overgrazed. So I guess this is a demonstration why rotational grazing systems really uh, are not the answer. You really need to be planning in terms of um, a regenerative approach to, to grazing. You really need to be planning appropriate use of each paddock based on available feed and the area and the needs of your livestock. So um, the long graze periods that were indicated in paddocks one and three, I think they were 20 and 29 and 30 days. So incorporating the grazing plan into a, a, a whole farm or property plan, looking at this grazing plan, that would suggest that, um, that these two paddocks would probably be the priority candidates for, subdiv for subdivision of those paddocks and that would um, improve the utilisation of the available feed and animal production. But importantly, each of these paddocks would benefit because there was none of them that actually achieved what I consider to be the, the magic number in terms of stock density, which is 200 DSE per hectare. Having said that, controlling the grazing and appropriate grazing will definitely provide benefits. But the most important thing is that you know on 1 December, you have enough herbage mass to sustain 46 pregnant cows for at least 150 days and have 1,500 1, kilograms of dry matter per hectare residual on the ground at the end of April. And so you've to my mind, that's probably the, the most important thing is that you've got great peace of mind uh, knowing that you can achieve that and there is no need to pro provide hay in this circumstance. Certainly, if you decide to, um, to provide hay, then um, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll address that question um Miriam at the at the end if that's okay <laughs> um I'm just about there um but again just to demonstrate the um the grazing plan the it's the file is called the AIMS graze plan calculator um and it is a tool it's an excel spreadsheet 
to assist the process, but this whole grazing plan is feed budget based. So um, if you go to this website here, there is uh, an Excel spreadsheet and there's also a guide to use the calculator. Just keep in mind that the, the preset values that are in the uh, spreadsheet are for Eastern states. So you'll need to modify um, and, and update uh, according to your situation. But um, um, with all of this, it's the principles that is really the key. Um, and they apply regardless of your environment. So um, just to, to finish up, um, the main point is that um, planning is, is essential to uh, achieve the, um, the optimal outcomes in terms of, of grazing management. And it's only by measuring herbage mass that you can make informed decisions uh, using pasture growth rate calculations. Um, your water use efficiency will give you an indication of the, of the health of your landscape as a whole. It's basically a measure of how well your pastures are converting rainfall into pasture dry matter. Um, and most important is preparing a feed budget and the most in, important time in your environment to prepare a feed budget is at the end of November or around the end of the growing season. And that might vary from place to place, but certainly going into the summer. And the checklist, it's just one of many tools, but um, I believe that it's it's pretty simple relatively uh, and it's, it's uh, straightforward and it really... Uh, your skills at pasture assessment will improve with practice. But I firmly believe that actually planning the grazing is the single most important activity that you can undertake as a grazier to ensure that pastures are utilised uh, appropriately. And the, the basic message is grow more, use more and leave more. And um, you'll always be in, in, front of the in front of the game. And on that note, I've only run over by 17 minutes this time, Kate. No, <laughs> you pop. haven't run over because it's till 5.30, so you're fine. <laughs> uh, that was fantastic, Judy, because, um, you know, it's hard sometimes to wrap your head around numbers, uh, but I think right. your process makes it, it's very logical and very easy to follow. And uh, I'm pretty sure if anyone's like me, uh, we can go back now, we can perhaps review the recording and download the um the um, stuff from your website and just yep. go through it and, and it'll be it'll be much easier to follow. And, you know, we just need to get out there and start monitoring, as you say. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, there's not too many people anti-numbers than, than me. <laughs> but, it, but it really, I mean, it's doing a feed budget is like a cash flow budget. You know, when you, you, you yep. know, you've got this much available and you need this much but you want to leave some capital in the bank for a rainy day or <laughs> otherwise uh, for a drought scenario, yeah. um, but also for, to have that capital growing for you. And so your capital is in the residual herbage mass that you leave behind, which is building soil health and building capacity in the whole environment. Yeah. And, and you know, more and more, I believe that the, the time that animals are, are not in a paddock and the amount of material that you leave behind after grazing are, are really the keys in terms of determining production and, and the productive potential. Yeah. Um, and I'll, um, I know Miriam's got another question, so we'll perhaps come to that in a minute. And um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, while uh, other, people, other people are thinking about questions, because I'm sure they are okay. for questions, I've got a couple that I've jotted down <laughs> as you've gone shall along. I, shall I address Miriam's before? Yeah, yeah go, go, for, yeah, go so, for Miriam's and then we'll go back to me. Um, yes, the, the complaining of, of hunger sooner than expected. Yeah, so so the, there's only a few variables, Miriam. Um, yes, so if they are complaining of, uh, of, of hunger sooner than, than you expect, then you either have to adjust the rating that you've uh, allocated in terms of DSCs, um, you know, I think that there's there's a lot of science behind um, those DSC ratings and uh, and animal requirements. So you've either underestimated the available herbage mass, or overestimated the animal requirements, 
or there's uh, an error in terms of um, of your your grazable area. So there's there's only a few variables that that you need to look at to find where the area is, you know, where the error is in your calculations. But the other benefit of having more paddocks um, and and a grazing plan is that you can a attend to that error early on um, and hopefully get any any gremlins out of your calculations, you know, at the beginning of the summer rather than get to the crisis at the end of March or into April and um, or in many cases even sooner than that. So, yeah, and I think um, um, you, I mean, you mentioned it in your presentation that you, it's a plan, but you need to be checking it, don't you? You need to check it regularly to make sure. That yeah, you're... yeah, and and it, you know, um, the the stick is just a, a tool to to help with with getting your eye in. But you know, once you once you get into the habit of actually actively assessing pastures on a on a regular basis, then you know it's you you walk into the paddock and and you can basically put a number on on what you're seeing in front of you. So. Mm. Because um, right, we have a question from um, Helen, who says, "How do you suggest drying the cut pasture samples before weighing it?" Mm, yeah, um, I, I this whole method is designed so that um, it, it negates the need for you to be drying the samples. But um, by all means, if you want to get more accuracy in your estimates, Helen, then then you can go down the path of, of drying the, the pasture samples. I mean, most of um, most of the cutting and drying and weighing that that um, we did, I had access to the um, the drying ovens at, at university. Um, and I, I say that because probably the uh, easiest other method is to, um, to dry them in a microwave, but there is a high risk of samples catching fire in a microwave. <laughs> And it Don't smells <laughs> really, really bad. Um, there is some, um, yeah, the, it's it's quite offensive. This the smell of grass being uh, being microwaved. So um, the other way to do it, uh, if you've got time and patience, is to just spread the sample on a table in the sun. It would probably take um, probably a week or two to get sufficient moisture out of um, out of the samples um, to give you a, a an actual dry weight. But um, as I said, that you know, if you can get an estimate of the the height of the bulk of the pasture and how closely spaced the plants are in that pasture, the density of um, of those plants, then you know that that will give you a first uh, you know a, a pretty good foundation to um, to estimating the amount of available herbage mass in any paddock. Uh, and Miriam has commented that if we choose. If we choose to roll out hay through the no growth period, we need to manipulate the spreadsheet to, to account for the extra external. Yeah, I, I, ideally, yes. So, so that'll give you more information on your on your pastures. So, so I think um, again, there's a an important distinction to make. Um, and I I heard a few people uh, when I was um, in the lower Blackwood a few months ago referring to hay as being a supplement um, but uh, hay and silage and those sorts of feeds are, are definitely substitution for pasture and um, so if there is a need to um, to roll out hay uh, and substitute the standing pasture then then yes in terms of informing your pasture decisions then it would be ideal to to discount um, the pasture herbage mass based on the amount of dry matter that you're providing in the form of hay. Um, uh, Helen says that calving here usually starts in January, so feed demand increases before the summer's end. Um, and she also says, thanks, I don't have to get out the analysis. But actually, <laughs> uh, that's a good point. Uh, and I, I sort of had a kind of a question related to that, yeah. I guess. And um, when you were talking about optimal grass, uh, grass growth, um, for animal nutrition versus optimal gro growth period for um, soil health, I suppose. Uh, yes, yeah. You know, have you got any comments in regards to perhaps moving lambing and calving times to perhaps? Yeah, I, um, I mean, every every individual is going to have 
um, their reasons for lambing or calving at, at a particular time. Um, and, you know, there are pros and cons, um, you know, in, in every situation because every situation is unique. So, but, you know, if you were to consider the, um, the period of um, uh, peak demand uh, in cattle at least is about six weeks post calving. So the, the cow, the um, protein and metabolizable energy requirements of the cow peak around about six weeks after they drop the calf. So uh, in most circumstances, it's, it's ideal to try and match the period of peak demand with the period of optimal pasture growth and, and quality. And so um, my, my estimate of when that is, um, I mean, and it was one of the things that was a, a standout um, when I was there in June, Kate, that um, um, the, the, the peak demand of most people in terms of calving and lambing coincided when pastures were just starting to to get going mm. which is which is fine from an animal nutrition perspective but unless you've got that that base that residual base then you know having the requirements of the animals increasing in excess of the rate of growth of the pasture at the time that the pasture is most vulnerable then it's it's actually quite um, damaging um, from a, a long-term production potential. And is that applicable regardless of whether it's an annual or perennial? Um, yeah, so the same, yes. But I mean annuals obviously die at the end of the end of the growing season, but their residual herbage mass is really important in terms of soil protecting the soil and uh, encouraging soil processes. So the more bulk that you've got at the end of that uh, non-growing period protecting the soil surface, the better the growth will be coming into the into the autumn. Mm. Um, but it's it's less important in an annual base pasture. But the other impression that I got was most people were looking to improve or increase the proportion of perennial grasses in their pasture. Mm. And so if you if you do that at the time that the perennials are, do that being increase the grazing pressure on the land as you're trying to get perennial grasses established, then they, they will be overgrazed every time and they, they won't make it past the establishment phase. So I think um, there was a few people that I suggested, you know, if you're trying to introduce perennials into the system, you know, maybe maybe do it on on not more than 10 percent of the property in uh, in a year and really nurse those perennial grasses through that first that first autumn especially uh, mm. and into spring just to mm. give them it's a huge investment and you want to really um, give them the best opportunity to get established obviously you know if growth is um is going great guns and and there's sufficient herbage mass there to graze but you really want to be monitoring how much you take out and making sure that those individual perennial grasses are not overgrazed. Yeah. Uh, uh, and Miriam's just made one last comment. Or how long does the peak last for? Yeah, the um, peak doesn't doesn't last for too long. So it, it increases up to six weeks, Miriam, and then, then it starts to drop off. Um, but obviously, uh, as the cow's peak drops off, the the calves are actually getting into um, into more grazing and will be um, consuming more of the pasture, you know, relative to the first six weeks of their life. And and the same applies to to sheep. But I I can't give you a time frame for the sheep. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but mm. I, I imagine it would be sort of somewhere between three to four weeks after after lambing that um, that they come into peak lactation, and then. From there on, the the lamb too would be taking more um, grass as a proportion of its total diet. Mm. Mm, there was certainly some food for thought there in terms of lambing and calving. <laughs> 
not sure how people might feel about that. <laughs> to make well, you know, it, 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 you know, that's only one of the factors that will be mm. um, coming into the consideration of of, um, of lambing and calving time. You know, everybody's situation, everybody's pastures um, um, and, and life sure. situations and priorities are going to be different. So, um, you know, I don't think that there's a, a right or a wrong but um, from a landscape perspective and uh, an animal nutrition perspective, it's probably um, it makes more logical sense to try as as best you can match the animal requirements with your, the growth curve of your pastures. And of course, unless you're actually monitoring your pastures, then that's not really you know it's really guesswork um, and. I mean, most people intuitively know that pastures will start to grow in autumn, but all we're doing is actually putting some numbers on it. Um, and it was it was quite obvious, um, you know, there were some pastures uh, that, you know, if you assume pastures were growing from, from a, a, a baseline of zero at the beginning of March to when I was there, which was about 60 days later, around about, there were some pastures that I recorded that would have, grown at a rate of you know 45 kilograms per hectare per day and others that were closer to 10. So mm -hmm. the the productive potential varies enormously um, but the best way to start to work to increase productive potential is to manage what you're leaving behind. And you have, and you have the win-win of improving your soil at the same time. <laughs> exactly. So as you improve your soils, um, you improve the photosynthetic capacity of your pastures. Um, you improve the productive potential of your pastures. You can then run more stock. Your carrying capacity will increase. You know, but it's carrying capacity too is is a moving target. You know, it's going to change, probably less so in your environment year to year. Um, it seems like it's a, a pretty a pretty safe rainfall environment down there, Rel relatively speaking. Relatively, <laughs> yeah. yes. But, but it's still it's you know I think the concept of a of a set sort of carrying capacity in in any environment is really a nonsense these days. Uh, as the as the environment um, becomes in, increasingly variable as well, um, you know it's really critical that um, you keep an eye on um, matching stocking rate to carrying capacity and don't overutilize your pastures because overutilization um, costs you in the short term and it costs you in the long term. Mm. And it's the easiest way, you know, managing utilization. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a retrospective measure because you can only really measure it after the fact, but, but keeping an eye on it through the seasons Will give you an indication in terms of how you're traveling and um, and how the annual utilization rate will look at the end of the end of the year mm. gosh we could carry on this <laughs> very easy to keep talking so Indeed. interesting <laughs> um and actually for everyone's benefit if they weren't aware we actually did a podcast with judy last month or june when she was here which yes. is just a little micro version of this but really we were focusing on grass growth weren't we and all about that so um, you can find that on our website or on um, apple um, podcasts or, or spotify um, and also you may be interested in signing up to judy's online course that was produced by smart soil last year or year before i can't remember um year before last i think year before last um yeah. and it's it's yeah. a very comprehensive nine module course designed for self-paced learning um, we have managed to secure a discount for our subscribers. So if you're interested in that program, um, send me an email and I will um, send you a link to it with our discount voucher. <clears throat> so anyway, Joe, Judy, thank you so much for such a fascinating um, and very comprehensive um, presentation. Now, I'm, I'm amazed that you managed to cover all that you did in an hour and a half, <laughs> but but without bamboozling us, which was fantastic. It was, it was, a, it was, it was a bit so, ambitious, I know. So hopefully, um, it wasn't lost in in translation. But um, uh, but it's no. all there to go back and um, um, and utilize those tools. So yeah. Um, well, and, we'll let you go. We'll let you go because it's late. Please. Oh, and someone says thank you. It's such a great tool. 
Um, we just started the start of our journey. Um, we just bought 35 hectares with zero livestock at the present, so there's plenty of time for planning, so that's great. <laughs> um, all right, Judy, well, we'll say good night to you. Um, thank you very much. And to our audience, um, I've just popped up our survey, which I really appreciate it before you sign out, if you could complete it. Um, it just takes a few minutes and it's really helpful for, for us to make sure we're pr providing the content that you want. Um, and I'll just let you know while you're doing that, that um, our next event um, is another webinar coming up next week, next Tuesday, with Dr. David Johnson and his wife, Hui Chun Su. And it's on the Johnson Sioux Composting Bioreactor System. Uh, that's uh, next Tuesday, 16th at 8 a.m. Perth time. Um, so hopefully you can sign in then. Uh, and so until then, uh, good night to everybody and good night, Judy. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everybody.